Welcome to uh, Minnesota Senate Human Services Committee. It's Monday, March 27th. Call to order. We have a number of uh, bills that our, our plan, folks, is to get, we have 16, um, and there are still, here's the, the thought process on this was, these are bills that were to be laid over um, for consideration, all depending upon, of course, what our fiscal notes look like, right? And we know we got a, a, a simple target. I don't know if you've heard my public uh, comments about that, but, but I'll make it clear. We know what we need in, in this uh, world that we live in to uh, make the systems work, and it's all systems in human services, and um, I am, I'm just here to tell you that, you know, depending upon, you know, how our, how our matching the, the, the budget requests go uh, going forward, but the, the, the plan is today to hear the bills, lay them over for possible inclusion, that means then on Friday, um, we'll take public testimony, I believe, is that correct? Yes. Friday is public testimony on the full package, um, and we are, because of the fact that we still don't have some fiscal notes, um, Senator Utke, we decided then to move the hearing instead of Wednesday to Friday that should, uh, we should have everything in place so that we're fiscally responsible. And just to uh, confirm to people, it's 10 a.m. on Friday. So if you want to bring a charcuterie board like Senator Abler just did, uh, feel free to do that in, uh, in tea or whatever that needs to do. 10 a.m. Friday, is that going to, does that work for you? Awesome. We're good on 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. Friday works. Thank you, everybody, for that. I don't know. Is there anything else, members, that, that I've left on the table? No? All right. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start with uh, Senator Draskowski. We actually, come on up and introduce your bill. We heard your bill last week, Senator, um, and your, the, folks, um, the folks from uh, Red Wing absolutely did a, did a really, uh, really good job. So if you would just go ahead and introduce your bill and, and um, tell us what we need to do. And if you could do that in less than 35 minutes, I would appreciate that. And, and no yielding to anybody. I don't want to hear you, you know, I'm glad you're laughing, Steve. So <laughs> welcome to the committee, Mr. Steve, uh, Senator Draskowski, Senate File 2896. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I, I don't really want to take a lot of your time. Just thank you for hearing uh, from our folks in Red Wing last week. This is the bill that uh, would accomplish what they need. It makes them, uh, puts them an even keel with the Courage Kenny folks that you heard about as well. So that's what it does. And Kyle, thank you for your help. And there's an amendment, Mr. Chair, if you want to put it on the bill before you lay it over, that uh, Kyle got to put in better shape. Members, is there a, there, I don't have a note on that. Um, just one second. Uh, oh, there's an A1. Is it the A1? Is that what you're talking about? There is an A1 amendment. Um, Senator Rasmussen. Mr. Chair, I move the A1 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A1 amendment. Uh, Senator, if you could just tell us, it just put it in the language that you got some technical assistance on, is that correct? Yes, there was, uh, the original bill was written retroactively. This starts it on July 1st. Awesome, so good with that. Members, you got it. Instead of a retroactive start, it starts it to July 1st. So what we had heard in the original bill, um, that just takes the retroactive piece out of it. So, Senator Utke? We're good? All right. Well, we can wait till it get printed off, I suppose. No, we're good. <laughs> so, it, no, we, I understand the bill, and we all understand what you're doing on that, so thank you for that. Senator Rasmussen moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. A1 is passed. Senator Draskowski, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Senator Draskowski, we are going to lay over Senate file. I'm going to get this right. 2896 for possible inclusion. Thank you for all your work on that. All right. Next, we're going to go um, Senate file 3050. Uh, we're going to do, it's going to be Senator Abler. It is uh, Senate file 3050 is the White Earth Nation specific digital therapy tool development for substance use disorder services appropriation. Senator Abler, to your bill. This is kind of a, a follow along about what you started a couple years ago, isn't it? 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the White Earth Nation Substance Use Disorder Digital Therapy Tool. Oh, you already said that. Yes. Anyway, Mr. Chair, this kind of tool can make a difference in the lives of many people by providing follow-up, and it's a, it's a proposal for a pilot to White Earth. It's an amazing project. With that, I'll turn it over. I, there's, a, there's no amendment. I'll turn it over to my testifier, who will be way more interesting. Thank you, Senator Abler. And uh, for the record, uh, testifier, your name, please. Uh, Dave Wellstone. Mr. Wellstone, welcome to uh, the Human Services Committee. Thank you. Not been this nervous in a long time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, so been really excited several years ago. Um, so I, start, I came out of working on policy, mental health, and addiction, then started doing sober housing, um, and then decided in watching folks coming into the sober house, the opposite is the, is the, the addiction is the opposite, connection is the opposite of addiction. I am actually nervous. And so, in seeing all these folks come in with their phones, um, needing resources, not just resources around addiction, but resources around life in general, um, decided to uh, build a tool that would help people. And so we, we built a platform that allows, uh, it's a tool for folks in recovery, a handheld app, and then it connects to people that are, are working with them, um, treatment professionals or others that allows them to prioritize care, see who needs help right away. Um, we have resources, we have stories, we've got contingency management, um, we have check-ins that are color-coded. And so we're really having an impact in the treatment center space, and we really wanted to have an impact in those that were really disproportionately affected, um, i.e. Native Americans, and started working with White Earth in their urban site and then up on the reservation, and we're actually in every um, program that White Earth has now, um, the medication-assisted treatment program, all the substance use programs, their access to recovery, uh, and their overdose response. And one thing that we've realized in working with Alina and having some great success with Alina is that this tool has to look like the folks that we're serving. And so we really want to make this fit Native culture, um, uh, Native medicines, it has to uh, have the feel and the look, and it doesn't at this point. And so we're working closely with White Earth to develop that so that we can have a huge impact where we know that this is needed. Well, thanks, Mr. Chair. And so we, we've discussed this a good deal of time in the past in this committee. Uh, that a lot of substance use programs are in the 30% success rate or you know, just not exciting. And this is, I think, in the in its pilot work has been in the 60, 70 percent. We're, we're up pretty system? high. And I, I can tell you, just in the virtual addiction care program at Alina, which we're studying now, and we're going to come out with the study, um, it's a newer program. It's been able to quadruple in size since they started using Pathfinder, so really uh, providing services to folks in, in rural areas. We've got a total in the last just few months of this 237 members, eight staff members, and just this last month we had almost 3,000 app opens. 21% uh, of the people are using it regularly and 100% of the staff. And so, yes, we're, we're, we're having a big impact. Senator Abel. Mr. Chair, this is the follow-up here. So then they can tell if a person's on track, they check in, how am I doing? And it's a way to leverage staff and to have tremendously more success. And you know, Mr. Chair, if we can go from 30 to 60, people don't, they, I mean, they, they simply don't die, but they also have productive lives and they make their families it's much, so much better. So I know you know that, Mr. Chair, but this is a stellar program, I hope, there's a way we can do this. And, and thank you, Senator Ayler. Senator Atke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I must have missed it right at the beginning. Mr. Wellstone, you're... You work with Pathfinder. Yes. You're from Pathfinder. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question there is, because I was looking up your stuff on your website, and you already work with White Earth. What yes. kind of, uh, this is something different, but what are you currently doing with them just for uh, kind of the full picture? Yes. Mr. So, so we're in all of their behavioral health programs with the app that we use with everybody else. And what we've really realized is the need for cultural medicines and the cultural fit. Uh, everything from, you know, languaging um, uh, to the personalized cultural check-ins to the IDs to the badges and habits, native medicines and rituals, traditions, teachings, language, really need to make it fit so that it works in the native communities. Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and this is uh, for either you, Mr. Chair, or Senator Abler, um, as you... You're both on the bill, but um, again, I was looking at 
you know, this is a, a $4 million uh, grant to Pathfinder, and you look through this and it gives instructions of, you know, what it's all doing. Well, I get to looking at the fiscal note, and even in the fiscal note under the assumptions, it FTE. says the bill language requires that technology work be conducted by the White Earth Nation and not by the Department of Human Services. So this is a deal between basically the work is with the White Earth Nation and Pathfinder, but yet we're adding 1.5 FTEs. Any idea why? I mean, I can see the little bit here, but it seems like all the work is being done outside of this place, and we're still getting hit. So, Senator Utke, I appreciate your fiscal hawkiness on that. That's always the, the piece. You know, it's the, I know the integration with, because we remember in Senator, uh, last year, Senator Abler's committee, no, two years ago, was when we started doing this pilot uh, for Alina and Anoka, and they were seeing engagement up. I mean, it was because we know that uh, the success rate has just been really bad, but then we've seen applications like this, and it's working. Um, they're able to track, and then because of that, I suppose it would, the assumption was it would increase the billing side of it, Senator Abler, if, if all of a sudden you had could, to add a new you could, person. You could ask them if you wanted. There's, there's a slew of them sitting here eating charcuterie boards, so if you wanted to have them come down and... <laughs> I don't know, Elise Bailey or Matt, do you have an answer to that? Why a one point, why a 50.15 like FTE was like added to that? Is that, one. Um, here she comes. Miss Bailey will have an answer. Thanks for coming down. And I just said, I'm never going to call you guys down here, but I've never had, the, this is actually one of those, huh, there's a point one five FTE. Yes, tell us why. Mr. Chair, uh, members, I, I would have to look into that and, and assess the fiscal note. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a, an answer for you. No, that's okay. I think, I think to Senator Utke's point, um, as we lay this over, I think we got a couple of days here to maybe be, you know, come back to that. But I think that Senator Utke, I saw that it had a cost of $17,000 and a fringe of $3,000. That's your question, correct? Actually, you've got... Uh, 144,000 over the biennium. You're you're starting out with a, I believe a, that's an upfront administration cost of 17,744. So then they're adding two uh, a per or FTE and a half. So it, it's a small amount, but it's still just wondering. Yep. Considering being it lays out the fact that it's um, White Earth and Pathfinder working this out. I just was. No, it's a good question. It, I think it's that, small, but yet it, it, I don't know. What, did we do that? Do you remember last year when we did that, or two years ago when you guys yeah. did that with the the last time we did um, an application like this? I don't. I guess maybe that's a good question to ask. Maybe Miss Bailey can come back to um, the committee and just you know we'll, before Friday, before Wednesday, maybe if you could find out and just send a note out and to Senator Utke, um so we can get that taken care of. But. Um, Thank you for that yep, absolutely. information. Absolutely. Is that fair enough, folks? Sure. Want to lay this one over? And then I just I guess one more question, Senator Abler, it's, uh, it's, um, David, uh, Mr. Wellstone, is the um, how scalable is that four million when you were looking at that? Is that a, a four million? I, that's fine. I just I'm thinking I'm thinking how scalable stuff is today. I just I, it's, it's an unfair question <laughs> right now in front of you. So well, it's a good question <laughs> to ask. No, it's a good question to ask. Million. That doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> It, it would be better than nothing for, I think we tried to really hit what we thought could get there, but I, I'll, I'll I got it. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wellstone. Senator, well, or Senator uh, Abler and, and Mr. Wellstone, thank you so much for being thank here. We'll, we'll lay this one over. Next up, you have Senate file 1953. Uh, Senator Abler. Thanks, Mr. 1593. Look at I'm I'm looking backwards here. After a while, you're seeing mailboxes turning into people if it's you get right. tired enough. Um, Mr. Chair, there's a, this is a bill about uh, EIDBI rates, and there is a, the commissioner needed some advice, apparently, Mr. Chair, so I'll move the A230068 amendment. Um, and there's a few changes. They delete a section three, which apparently you don't need anymore, and, um, so, and it changes the date. So with that, I'll move the A23 amendment. Thank you, members of the A23, moving the date. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator Abler, to your bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The EIDBI program has uh, been a remarkable help to many families um, in helping them with their autistic child to uh, get services and sometimes move beyond the need for much later. Um, but rather than me tell a story, I've got a person who's much more eloquent and more interesting as well compared to the last testifier as well. So let's just go with that trend. Sarah Driver, welcome to the committee. No pressure. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Chair and committee members, my name is Sarah Drever, and I'm here as a parent to tell you more about my experience and talk about my kids, which should be an easy enough job, so everybody loves to do. Um, but I'd also like to ask for your support and consideration of these measures. My partner, Aang, and I are parents of twin boys, Ari and Archer. Our kiddos just turned three years on February 19th, and to say it has been a roller coaster, having given birth and raising special needs twins during a COVID pandemic is an understatement. After a difficult pregnancy and two months of hospital bed rest, I gave birth at 26 weeks. My partner could not be present when I was giving birth, and my boy spent 111 and 117 days in the NICU. Navigating services from the moment they were born was difficult, but I was privileged being educated and experienced as an advocate. Before transitioning home, I made sure to apply for disability and quickly got the kids smirted, and they are on Medicaid. The diagnosis for both boys changed, but usually revolved around developmental delay and neurological disorders. I had the boys assessed and got a waiver through the county for PCA choice services. I grew up with an autistic sibling and recognized some of the telltale signs in both of my boys as early as 12 months. One of my kids skipped crawling and failed to maintain eye contact or follower track objects, and the other did not respond to stimuli or his name, and yet he passed all of his hearing exams. By 18 months, neither child verbally identified mom or dad, and they were frequently inconsolable. Archer could not handle transitions and had an extensive oral aversion, and he was deemed failure to thrive and placed on a G-tube. And Ari did not engage with his brother, parents, or other people, and frequently rocked and flapped his hands around his face. We sought a diagnosis right away at 18 months as soon as it was clinically possible to do so. Despite a very early diagnosis by developmental pediatrics at Children's, we were told we needed a CMDE with a formal recommendation for EIDBI to obtain ABA therapy. We waited almost a year for a CMDE evaluation, and I called every CMDE evaluator listed on the Help Me Connect site as I was directed to do. And after obtaining our assessment, we were ready to get therapy as soon as possible and didn't care if it was in a clinic or home-based, and we were willing to travel anywhere. I went back to the Help Me Connect and DHS website and went on the list of providers, asked our pediatrician, asked developmental pediatricians for recommendations, and I could not find anyone without an extensive wait list. And some would not even put me on their wait list because it was so extensive or had been frozen. A few providers even said that they had reached their quota of Medicaid patients. We continued to wait on more than one provider's wait list, and after a year of waiting, I left my job in legal aid to work on resource development in an attempt to make services more available, not only for my kids, but for others. I have pursued grants, foundation donations, and corporate and individual donations, and now I'm here talking to you today. I work full-time in development now and my children just qualified through the Osseo School District for special education preschool. While we have had monthly Help Me Grow visits, regular developmental pediatric appointments, and private physical therapy, my kids have not had the benefit of therapy for their spectrum disorders. Ari has a diagnosis of level three autism. He is semi-verbal in that he repeats words or phrases, but he cannot ask for things or tell me his needs or feelings, which is so hard as a parent. Wow. He has begun to self-harm, including hitting his head and pulling his hair. And he remains withdrawn and does not play with other children, even his brother. He has damaged our home and is now on medication for hyperactivity. Archer is more functional and has less harmful behaviors, but has more physical needs. He has started hurting Ari as a way to get him to interact and to get attention from adults. We cannot keep a PCA or babysitter, and we have not had time off or respite from anyone other than immediate family members in the entirety of their lives, which I remind you is three years. <laughs> Our preschool has brought up that the challenging behaviors, especially of Ari, 
may make it so that school is not the best place for him. Archer has trouble navigating the stairs. This is not an issue now because I can carry him, but it will be an issue soon. Ari is not danger averse. And as many times as we've tried to tell him about not running out into the yard or watching for other dangerous objects, he just doesn't connect the dots. I'm not a therapist. I don't have experience or education in early childhood services or healthcare delivery. And I don't even have other kids. This is my only experience. And I'm truly winging it, as many parents do. And while we all do our best, I know this isn't what my children deserve or need. And despite my best efforts, I can't get them access to EIDBI. I've done everything so that I feel like I have become an expert in it, all of these acronyms and all of the things I should be doing. I've made every appointment, called every person, completed every assessment, and completed all the paperwork and intake packets, and I still can't help my children. At three years, my boys have spent the majority of their lives on wait lists. At this rate, they will likely age out and thus not obtain the early intervention that experts recommend. And if Ari continues the challenging behaviors and self-harm, he will have to stop preschool. My partner and I have considered many things, including quitting our jobs, moving in with our parents to become eligible for Head Start, or moving states in an attempt to find more accessible or better supported services. ABA therapy would allow my kids to work on occupational skills that would help them develop during this crucial time in their lives, but would also help them work on the things that have become extremely limiting and dangerous. EIDBI would allow for therapy to address harmful behaviors and maladaptive actions. We could keep both my kids in school and provide opportunities for them to be surrounded by peers and by experts. Ari and Archer had such a tough start. And we were originally told they would, be, they would need until the age two to be caught up developmentally. Now we are well past that, and both kids are still developmentally delayed significantly. And it is honestly heartbreaking to hear your child is failing to thrive. But it is even worse when you know there are resources that would help your child thrive. And you can't make mountains to make those resources accessible. I'm also here because I'm able to do so. I was able to get time off of work. I'm connected to people and to the legislative process to know that I have this option to speak to you today. But I also note that my kids are not white bodied. They are regularly exposed to three languages and are first generation Americans. They have special needs and are medically complex. I am well aware that all of these things are going to make their paths more difficult. And as their mom, like all moms, I would do anything to provide any and every opportunity and resource and therapy to my kids. And in closing, I want to share that I told my children about this opportunity to speak to all of you today. And I hope that someday they will understand the importance of advocating for others and know how much their parents love and support them. And in response, Archer, Archer assured me that this was going to go well and that you were going to support these bills because laligators, which is legislators, are Anung Kao Kiet, which is Vietnamese for heroes. Like Spider-Man and the police, heroes always help the people. So as one advocate to another, and as one parent to another, as I know many of you are parents as well, I thank you for your consideration, for your service, for your time, and for being the heroes that my children and so many other children across our state need. Ms. Traver, thank you. Um, as one parent to another parent, you are your child's best advocate, and I, we appreciate you here. Members, uh, Senator Abler to your bill. Oh, Senator Fate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your testimony. Um, my question is for Senator Abler. Um, so the bill says the Commissioner of Human Resource, I'm sorry, Human Services, uh, shall increase payment rates by 20% over the rates effective on June 20th, I'm sorry, June 30th, 2023. 
Um, I guess my question is, is, is that 20% increase, uh, does that fix the problem that we have, or do you think it should be more? I just wanted to get your insights of how, how that number or that amount was arrived at. Senator Ehler. Mr. Senator Fate, the next uh, bill talks about emergency grants for providers. Uh, that provider could answer that question really well. I'll predict it's probably not enough, but it's something we're trying to get something to stem the tide. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Abler. Um, a lot of us have a health insurance card in our uh, pocket. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us, we pass laws to help people get medical assistance. And so many times, especially in the medical assistance world, there's not enough doctors and care to go around. COVID has shrunk the available uh, slots from 4,000 to in the range of 2,000, mm -hmm. just because, and also the rates. And so leaving just stories like Miss Drivers here that just make me want to weep. And so I thank you for coming. And weeping doesn't get you any money. It doesn't <laughs> help your kids. But um, Senator May Quaid, thanks for being the co-author here, and Senator Hoffman. And, um, we can discuss this more if you want, Mr. Chair. The next bill is kind of similar. So. No, Senator Abel, I think so. Let's bring up, uh, so it's, uh, Senate file 1593 as amended will be laid over possible inclusion. So Senator Abler, we got Senate file 1765, which gets to hopefully Joel Bakken. Uh, come on up. Um, you, can, you can maybe answer the uh, impending question that Senator Fate asked Senator, the good Senator from Anoka, and I think the good Senator from Anoka... Uh, 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 so defaulted Chair, to you, Senator. Let me move seven, Senate file 1765, and there is an A1 amendment which um, changes some dates around and has some pretty much technical advice from the department. So if we could move that, that would be good. Uh, Senator Abler moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Senator aye. Abler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just as a brief introduction, and thank you for being here. The um, You got an A22, Senator, don't oh, you? Oh, I do. Yeah, I think, uh, don't I? I don't have that in front of me, so. Um. Was there an A2 as well? It's not come back yet, so. Oh, we'll do it later. Then we'll do it later. Uh, we can fine. always bring it back up and do it if we have to, if we later. No, over. you're fine. We can do that um, later. Just given time. Thank you. And Mr., uh, just kudos to Mr. Monahan, who is, uh, he's like the Spider-Man of this place. <laughs> and he is our Spider-Man. And then, and Batman be the to fiscal people. We should anyway, have so, some bumper music, Spider-Man uh, <laughs> bumper music for that. Then anyway, Mr. Chair, uh, in many cases, it can cost $100,000 a year uh, for the services to help these little ones uh, change their lives. Uh, and in too many cases, uh, most of the providers are going into a deficit, uh, and they're losing maybe $10,000 a year or more. Our testifier can give more detail, but it's in the range of that. Uh, at least at one provider I was talking to, losing $400,000 serving 45 uh, children. And after a while, they can't just make it up in volume. And these, these providers care just nearly as much as the parents do. They are committed and definitely eager to make a difference. And they shouldn't have to go bankrupt to do it. So, Mr. Chair, I turn it over to my testifier. Yes, Mr. Chair, my name is Joel Bakken. Uh, thank you for have, allowing me to speak today. My I represent the Autism Treatment Association of Minnesota and Solutions Behavioral Healthcare Professionals. As the chairperson of the Autism Treatment Association of Minnesota and Solutions Behavioral Healthcare, I express my strong support for passing 1765, a bill that would provide critical funding for early in intensive developmental and behavioral interventions, the EIDBI, the acronym we talked about in the programs across Minnesota. As many of you are aware, early intervention is crucial for these children. I think you spoke to that very well. Unfortunately, we are now faced with a lack of funding to attract skilled staff to provide early intervention services. You said that very well as well, such as ABA, which is impacting more than just you across the whole state. I have seen firsthand the devastating impact that the lack of funding has had on our clients and our organization. The great resignation of 2021 led to a 20% reduction in our workforce, resulting in a $600,000 loss over five months. Solutions did not have the option to raise our rates to make up for it. And we instead had to respond by closing our Breckenridge office and 
reducing our offices across, or reducing our services across all of our offices. We worked with DHS to try to creatively look at options, and we made up some ground, but so we, our doors are open, but our financial situation as of today is still tenuous. This is very consistent with other providers across the state. Like you mentioned, there's many families struggling to access care. Um, solutions like all individual providers care a lot, but we're not able to, to address the current service debt. Our wait list right now is more than doubled than where we were before. We serve 115 children, and we have 99 on our wait list. With little hope of starting these folks in 2023 for a majority of them. We would love to reopen our Breckenridge Clinic. We would love to expand to Wadena, Staples. That would be great. But because of the financial loss and the lack of applicants, Solutions is functioning basically at 80% right now, where we were before. These problems are not limited to rural areas, as you mentioned. Nearly all providers, including those in the metro, have extensive wait lists, huge staff shortages, and financial issues. Many agencies talk about locations closings as well. <sighs> Investing in the EIDBI program can have significant benefits for Minnesotans. By providing early intervention services, we can reduce the need for more costly interventions later in life, such as intensive special ed, institutional care, that nasty word that we talk about, and other care, health care services. This can ultimately result in a significant cost savings for our state and a better quality of life for our children and their families. In conclusion here, the lack of funding and the shortage of skilled staff have critically impacted autism services. It has caused extreme financial distress for our EIDBI providers. We've decreased our services, and ultimately we've negatively impacted the growth and development of this vulnerable population. I urge you to support Senate File 1765. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakken. Senator Abler, you have the A2 amendment now at your desk. I do, Mr. Chair, and uh, there's quite a bit of discussion in legislative prose about may, shall, must, where this uh, will put a new topic together with discussing providers and agencies. And so we're deleting the word providers and talking about agencies, which I won't ask Mr. Monahan to, to tell the difference, but welcome to the law, Mr. Chair. So with that, it, it uses, it does this like six times, and it talks about a minimum amount of time. So I'd move the A2 amendment. Members, I think Senator Abler described, we have now a new, instead of may and must, we have serves uh, provider and agency. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Post same sign. Uh -huh. Senator Abler. Thanks, uh, Mr. Bakken. Could you describe um, your financial situation? And there's a 20% raise on the last, uh, it was already, I'm just doing Senator Fate's job for him. Um, anyway, so there's a proposal in the last bill to raise rates 20%. Uh, to help you get the staff you need. Uh, we're talking about an emergency grant, um, but also at the base rate. Can you discuss rates and what kind of need you help you need to stay open? The 20% is essentially the base rate. I'm, I would look at a, a further study of that to really get down to the specifics of that. I mean, that's, that's the base rate that we need at this moment in time, if that answers your question. Senator Fate? That was good. <laughs> Senator Fate, I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, it's his question that I asked it. So that's it was a question that, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And I was laughing because he voted no on the Abler Amendment. And I don't no, he think you he heard yeah, that, so that was funny. Way to stick up for the providers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Senate file uh, 1765 will be laid over for, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. I don't see uh, Senator Omo Verbet, and so, oh, wait, there she is. Hey, hey. I was just going to keep uh, Senator Abel up there to keep running bills, but you're good. Um, what am I saying?
Senator, welcome to the committee. Your Senate file 1788. Spring has arrived. Tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wore this just so you'd be able to recognize me in the room. But well, actually, the, these two to the <laughs> left of me are the ones who said spring is here. This is good. So I, I'm not, my wife will tell me I don't understand. I have to wear stuff that can't, you know. Anyway, that's yeah. not even funny, but go ahead. We, we could use some spring here. <laughs> Thank you for bringing spring to this committee. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I can address, um, I'd like to address the amendment first, if that's okay, um, for this bill. Oh, uh, I got an A3. You want to, members want to hand out the A3 amendment? It's in your packets. Thank you so much. Um, you want to, do you want to talk about the A3 amendment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this language is the result of some technical assistance from DHS. The original language was the attempt um, to insert these three homes into the new property rate system, one of which is in my district. And there were just some challenges in doing that, but I think the language in this amendment will keep the homes in the current property rate system, adjust the respective rates so that they receive the same reimbursement as they would have under the new system. Um, it takes away the retroactivity of the rate increase, and then it makes it clear that the add-on goes away when slash if the home subsequently goes uh, through the moratorium exception process again. Wow. Here we go. <laughs> what a, I mean, that's a thank you. It looks like Ling, you're, you're with... Uh, Jeff Heineke, did I get that right? Yeah. Hey, I got, I got, I'm got. i I'm one for six today so far. So, uh, Ling Bloomston Care Center, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Heineke. I'm president and CEO of Ling Bloomston. Uh, we're a senior care campus located right by the fairgrounds in Como Zoo. Yeah. I'm here today representing my organization as well as two other nonprofit organizations, uh, Viewcrest Care Center up in Duluth and Chosen Valley uh, Senior Living down in Chatfield. Uh, we support Senate File 1788 as it corrects a rate issue caused with the uh, transition to a new property rate system that happened back in 2020 for nursing homes. Nursing homes make capital improvements to their facilities to better serve their residents and to make infrastructure uh, updates. And those updates are usually around code changes and safety. Under the long-term care system, for the facility to make improvements and to have those improvements reflected in our rates, the facility must get approval through the moratorium exception process. Our rates, in other words, or our projects, in other words, must be deemed necessary and an important investment into the older adults that we serve. The proposed improvements are reviewed during that process, and if approved, the facility's reimbursement rates will be increased to, re to reflect the cost of the improvements. The system for adjusting property rates that go through the exception process changed starting January 1 of 2020. Our three facilities went through the moratorium exception process prior to that date and were approved. One was approved in 2018, the other two in 2019. But all three projects were completed after the January 1, 2020 date. We are the only nursing facilities that had our projects approved before the new rate system took effect, but had the improvements completed after it took effect. Because of the timing of our approval, our respective rate adjustments were lower than what they would have been if our projects were approved in 2020 or after. As we sought approval, the legislature was considering changes to the property rate process. We knew that. But there was no certainty that anything would pass, and you all know all about that, or that whatever did pass would actually benefit us. Because of the uncertainty and our need to do our projects, we decided to push forward in hopes that anything, any of the changes would be retroactive. Senate File 1788 will correct this inequity by increasing our respective property rates to a level equal to that that we would have had if our projects were 
uh, approved and completed after January 1, 2020. Uh, I know that the system for creating uh, rates for nursing homes is complex, um, but we see our, our problem and its solution is fairly straightforward, and we would appreciate your support for this legislation that helps correct the issue, and I really do want to say thank you for allowing me to spend a few minutes of your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Heineke, for pointing out that was a good. Senator Rasmussen. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to mention this before the committee gets into it, too. With the amendment, it's actually eliminating the cost um, that might have shown up in the fiscal note, which was about $2.8 million. So the, um, wait, 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 wait. No, no. You need to slow down and repeat <laughs> Okay. That. So... You need to, it eliminates the what? There, there was a, a cost Let's that showed right up the in the fiscal note. One, um, and so the amendment, again, really want to thank DHS for working with us um, on this. Um, eliminates the cost that was related to the retroactivity of the increase. And that was okay. about $2.8 So wow. just wanted the committee to be aware before we got into questions. No, it's, I think it just eliminates the, um, the retroactivity on that. So the, would that eliminate the entire cost? Just the retroactivity. Just the retroactivity. Thank you. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move the A3 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Wow. 2.8, huh? because we're still waiting on a fiscal note. So with that, I think any members have any other questions for the good senator from Falcon Heights? If not, Senator Etke, you had one? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think you mentioned it, uh, but I had written it down earlier as a question, that these are the, the three properties that are listed are the only three in the state that would qualify. There is no others that anybody knows of, correct? That Mr. Heineke. Under this. Senator, uh, yeah, that's correct. We're the only three facilities that had the approval happen just before the legislative change, but the projects actually were completed after the change. So we are kind of happened right in the middle, and we are the only three that that happened with. Senator thank you. Heineke, good question. Thank you. Mr. Meineke, thank you, uh, Heineke, and thank you, Senator Verbet Omu Varbatin, for bringing this bill and for trying to help fix our system. Appreciate that. Uh, with that, uh, your bill as amended will get laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you very much. Thank so, you. So Senator Abler, Senator Farnsworth is here. I wonder if we could, should we do that? Should we have Make Senator, him huh? Stay to the end. Make him stay to the end? The last one. Okay, I can do that. You guys okay with that? <laughs> All those in favor say aye. <laughs> Senator Farnsworth, come on down, man. <laughs> Wait, for the record, it voted on that. This, uh oh, make wait, I got, you know, it, we actually voted on that. Do I have to, like, add an amendment that I missed on something in it? <laughs> oh, Senator Farnsworth, welcome to our committee. It's your first trip here, isn't it? Thank you for that gracious uh, welcome. So, so wait a minute. You, you drove by Valentino's, right? Up in Chisholm, didn't you, on the way here? Uh, I, I did not. I live in Hibbing. Valentini's is Chisholm. Okay, so you didn't go through there to because it's, it's your first thing here. They have this Italian sausage that they've made for a hundred years, and I used to get it from Tomasoni because you can't get it anywhere else except from there. And I just thought, you know, what a great. I'm, I'm kidding because somebody's going to say that's <laughs> paola and that's not okay. So there's my radio days gone. I do have a face for radio. I'll let you guys know that. So. Senator Farnsworth, you got Senate file 2477. Talk to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do have the A1 amendment. Members, A1 should be, is it in your packet? It is in your packet. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move the A1 amendment. Members, the A1 amendment is in front of us. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the amendment um, is based on some technical assistance from, the, uh, from DHS. Um, to, to change the language to make the bill work a little bit better. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee, for hearing the bill. Um, I also would like to thank the Department of Human Services for their technical assistance on this bill. Um, Senate file 2477 was brought to me by one of my local nursing homes, the Heritage Manor in Chisholm, the same town as Valentini's, where we will be getting some sausage, I guess. Um, the bill will increase the property rate for Heritage Manor to address an error made when Heritage Manor went through the new moratorium 
exception process in 2020 and the impact of inflation on construction costs. With your permission, Mr. Chair, I believe I have Stacy Bernard joining us um, by Zoom to testify. I see Stacy. Yes, yes, Stacy Bernard is on the Zoom land. Stacy, there you are. Welcome to the committee, Stacy. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Stacy Bernard. I'm the administrator at Chisholm Health Center. Uh, we operate a nursing home under the name Heritage Manor here in Chisholm. Uh, I am here to support the Senate file 2477 as it corrects the good faith mistake that was made when Heritage Manor applied through the moratorium exception process, as well as recognizing the inflationary increase of construction costs. We recently completed uh, capital improvements for our care center to better serve our patients and make needed updates and infrastructure improvements. Under the long-term care rate system for us to make capital improvements and to have the cost of those improvements reflected in our rates, uh, we needed to get approval through the moratorium exception process. In the application process, the proposed improvements are reviewed, and if the proposed improvements are approved, the facility's reimbursement rates will be increased to reflect the cost of the improvements. The system for adjusting the property rates that go through the exception process was changed starting January 1st of 2020. Our nursing home, Heritage Manor, went through the moratorium exception process under this new system in March of 2020 and made an error in the data submitted. As this application process was brand new, the application instructions in 2020 were not clear to us, but we tried our best to submit the correct data. We tried to correct this error administratively, and we were told that the process does not allow for this correction administratively and that it had to be corrected leg legislatively. So Senate file 2477 will correct that error that was made and recognize the inflationary increase of construction costs. I appreciate your time and support for the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bernhardt, for being here. And isn't that, isn't your facility, is that up on the hill? Is that in, I'm trying to think, is that, is that the one yep. that's, I, yeah, is. I've been mm -hmm. there. I know friends that, yes, I, I know your facility. That's actually a really good facility. So um, thank, you. Thank, thank you for chiming in via internet. So um, Senator Farnsworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to help to correct this problem for um, one of the few nursing homes in my district. And as you know, we need all of the beds we can get, so this will be very helpful. Thank Appreciate you. And with that, Senator Farnsworth, as amendment, uh, Senate file 2477 will be laid over. So thank you very much. Senator Ra Abler. Yeah, you can go. Mr. Chair. Senator Abler, you got an A, you got no amendments on this we got one. No amendments on Ooh. this one, sorry. Senate file 2499. <laughs> so Mr. Chair, this uh, talks about uh, people getting driver's licenses. We went to transportation about this um, and I do not know what we're doing with this bill here, uh, what our pleasure is to talk about. We can discuss the whole bill. There's some rates in here. Um, and so uh, what is it where you want us to address? Senator Abel, I think the issue that, that lays, and I know you got Ms. Delwu here uh, would understand it, it's that the fee provisions and dismissal for the certified birth records, a lot of times people in recovery, you know, they're just it's stuff is missed. It's lost. It's not for whatever reason, right? right. And so um, if we... I'm just I, wondering what you want us to testify to. So. Uh, just the... The, the substance use disorder and why you're bringing it, you know, Go on ahead. the medical assistance side, don't you think? We'll offer the an ill-focused, broad description of the bill, Mr. Chair. So uh, I've got the ill-focused part. And what do you want to do with the disposition broad. of this then, Senator Abler? I think it's me. I don't know if transportation is going to pay for the driver's licenses or not. So um, I think we have a choice. They have to get paid for if they're going to be free. There was a concern in the transportation committee that we were going to ask them to eat the costs and the deputy registrars or whatever you call them. Uh, could not afford that. And so if we're going to give free, free licenses and so on, we have to, somebody has to pay for it. So, so. there's a fiscal note to that point? Um, I think Senator Rucky was about to raise that point, Mr. Chair. I bet you he was. I was just going to ask, is there a fiscal note? There's one that's been requested to Senator Rutke's point, Senator Abler, that there is a fiscal note, you know, that's been requested. Right. So. so I just want to know what you want the committee to know about? That's Nothing. All. I mean, just give us, you know, why is it, I guess here's the thing, because we started off this year talking about why. Why does this committee do what it, do what it does, right? The why. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, um, the why is, we know there's, a, there's lots of stuff out there that needs to be fixed system-wide, right? And the why is, you know, there's a song, 
you know, if I had a million dollars, you know, that's a Kurt Rutzen told me about it. He was listening to it on the way in yeah. today. And I said, no, if I had an extra few billion dollars to add to my target, we could fix the systems and we could set the systems forward that would work. It would be like, you know, you know, when I made the comment about being Job, well, you know, now that Passover is coming, you know, it's like the desert. Follow this committee because we're going to be in the desert. We're going to follow. We're going to look for manna. Let's go find the manna, Senator Abler, right? I mean, we might as well do that, right? Mr. Chair, so in terms of whenever I think of the question why, I think of Ms. Delwo, and I think she can quite ably answer that question and get us to the promised land. So. All right. Take us to find the manna, will you? Amy Delwo, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, it's a pleasure to be back with you. And you're correct, Mr. Chair. Um, earlier in session, you had an informational hearing where we covered the need in terms of uh, for substance use disorder treatment, et cetera, um, and recovery. And so I won't go back through that because we spent about 90 minutes together at that point. But I would like to sketch the bill. So my name is Amy Delwo. I am uh, the president of March. And um, March is a professional association of addiction treatment providers um, and professionals. And uh, so this bill comprises of three parts. One is that it focuses on our workforce and tries to relieve some burden on our workforce. Uh, secondly, it tries to support people who um, are living with uh, substance use disorder. And then finally, uh, it discusses a little bit of data. And so uh, to refresh people's memory, uh, the first three sections of the bill do relate to things like driver's licenses and birth records. And so when people um, have been uh, couch surfing or, or um, homeless, sometimes they lose these, uh, these uh, important documents, and so this waives those fees. Um, the next section, which is section four, adjusts a timeline in terms of the um, treatment, up, when a treatment plan needs to be updated. Right now it says weekly. Uh, we're requesting every 28 days, uh, which will relieve a burden for the LADCs. Uh, section five allows patients to receive counseling services after they've discharged because they've already made um, a relationship with that counselor. So we want to make sure that they can stay tethered in some way um, to their treatment should they, they need uh, some follow-up support. Section six uh, provides some reasonable flexibility in terms of treatment hour requirements uh, based on patient circumstances. So there are times in residential sites when uh, someone needs to go to the doctor, they may be ill, et cetera. And so this allows uh, the provider some flexibility to document that and um, maintain the same uh, level of care. Uh, then the next item, section seven, is about data. And basically, th there's minimal data that's shared with providers right now. Uh, and uh, we'd like to work more deliberately with the uh, department in terms of what kind of data we're able to see so that we can improve quality of services. Sections eight and nine provide for a temporary 24% rate increase. Um, and uh, I'll just reflect on uh, that there hasn't been a base rate increase since uh, 2010. In fact, well, there was a negative 4% increase and then a 3% increase. So we're, we're at a negative 1% increase <laughs> for the last 13 years. So um, henceforth, uh, the 24% rate increase, um, and that's predicated on the implementation of the rate study, which you passed um, in a previous session. And then finally, uh, the last uh, section relates to a work group. And that particular work group is, is in concert with the department to discuss what kinds of transitional support services that we can put in place for people who are leaving treatment and uh, require a little bit more time to gain a foothold in the community. Mr. Chair, that's the bill. Thank you, Ms. Del, Senator Abler. It's good. Questions from members, Mr. Members, any questions for the good senator? Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just looking here at this bill and the path that it's taken, and it's been brought up the, the question about transportation because of driver's licenses. That was the last committee that it was in, but, you know, it doesn't tell me anything here, and I don't, we don't have anybody here probably that in transportation that could tell us what took place. Ms. Delwo, were you at that committee hearing at all to know? how the conversation around driver's licenses and costs went? 
Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Aki, there was a different test. Um, uh, Ryan Service testified yeah. in that oh, hearing, okay. and so I wasn't att in attendance. Looks like Senator Abler might have testified. Mr. Chair, I had the privilege of being at that hearing. <laughs> and it's my only appearance at transportation this year, so I remember it like it was the only hearing I went to this year in that committee. Um, the committee by the re request by uh, Senator Zinsky was that we not have the department eat the cost, but that it be paid for by somebody so that the Hence. different uh, deputies that are around the state could not absorb that extra work for free. And so it's not my expectation that some that this will happen without somebody accounting for the cost. Okay. And they didn't seem to mind it otherwise. We got so a fiscal okay. note request that's okay, still Okay, so that was that. where yeah. that came from. And you, but it's just now who will pay to know right. if it can go forward. Because yep. um, I was thinking it hadn't been there, but when I could see that it had made that stop. But, no, no, but, thank okay. you for that. So no. we, we need somebody to step up to the plate and say we'll cover it. And, once they know what, how much it is? Yes. Okay. Would, I think that means this committee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You're good. Senator Abler, uh, Senate File 2499 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Ms. Delwell. Thank you, Senator Abler. Mm, Senator Rasmussen, you got uh, Senate File 2529. Um, and I think you're going to hand out an amendment for us, too, because you want to try to make this a twofer. Is Ben Ben here, Senator Rasmussen? Is he? All right. So, thank you, members. This A one amendment's being handed out. Senator Rasmussen, you want to talk about your A one and then um, get to your bill and then get to Mr. Anderson. So, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd move the A one amendment as an author's amendment. I'll Happy listen. to describe it. Uh, members, you want him to describe it. Thank you. Senator Ecke shaking his head yes. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the uh, underlying bill is uh, for a supplemental rate in Douglas County, and the A1 amendment uh, makes some technical changes as provided by DHS, in addition to adding in another bill that would provide a supplemental rate uh, in Crow Wing County. So, uh, Senator Rasmussen, just it's the same provider, and you did put in a, a fiscal request from our good friend Miss Bailey on that too, as well, or the F FSBO people. Yes, yeah. Right? The update on the fiscal uh, note should be pretty simple, um, given the math they already did on the first facility. And these uh, facilities are both Minnesota Adult and che Teen Challenge facilities. Oh, Crowing got it. So, Senator Farnsworth, thank you. Um, to your testifier, are you gonna? Do you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, explain the bill a little bit, Mr. Chair, and then hand it over to uh, Mr. Anderson. Sounds good. Um, so this bill would allow for a variance for the Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge facilities in both Alexandria and Brainerd. The current supplemental group residential housing rate is set at a cap of $250 um, per month and has not been changed in 22 years. This would allow the individual county to negotiate a reimbursement rate up to $750 per month. Um, there is precedence uh, for this as there have been several supplemental rate exemptions granted for different organizations located throughout Minnesota, including Hennepin, Ramsey, Sherburn, Benton, Stern, St. Louis, and Monoman counties. Uh, the services provided at these locations serve people from across the state and not just in the areas they are located in. And I want to, Mr. Chair, just talk a little bit about um, you know, my experience getting to know uh, Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge and their work. And the reason I'm uh, very passionate about uh, getting this bill done this session is just the excellent work that they provide and the impact they have in communities across the state. Uh, they are one of only two SUD providers in Minnesota to have gone through an independently conducted outcome study through the Wilder Foundation. And it's uh, just Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge and Hazelden are the two that have gone through that outcome-based study. And they've had remarkable success. 80% of their long-term graduates establish a sustained life of sobriety. Um, so remarkable success uh, for uh, their graduates. Uh, another aspect that makes their program unique is that they are a long-term program. Uh, their long-term program is 13 months long, um, which research has shown leads to uh, a higher success rate. Um, my uh, wife and I had an experience to meet with some of their clients and share a meal, and uh, I would say 
the overwhelming feedback that we got was just the hope that Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge provides to them and their families. Um, and you know, we're not only helping an individual find sobriety, but in many cases helping them get their uh, families and lives put back together. Uh, there's a strong need for this in both of the communities where Adult and, uh, and Teen Challenge are looking to expand. Um, and Mr. Anderson will talk a little more about that. And I also wanted to highlight um, impressive private philanthropy behind uh, these initiatives. Uh, the one in Alexandria, for example, uh, raised $15 million to build the facility. It'll be 100% funded through private donations. And in addition, this long-term program that we're talking about here receives more than 50% of its funding through private donations. And so uh, um, donors have also found value in this program. I, I believe, Mr. Chair, this uh, bill is a great investment for the state. Um, Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge has shown successful outcomes. It leverages private philanthropy, and it creates a sustainable model for a high-quality program in areas that need it a lot. And with that, I will turn it over to um, Mr. Sam Anders Anderson, who's the center director for the Brainerd campus um, for Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge. Mr. Anderson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Hoffman. Uh, it's my honor. It's my first uh, testimony before a Senate hearing. So Did again, you go by Valentini's in Chisholm, by the way? <laughs> no, but I could head up there. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> So I've been with Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge for 17 years uh, in this battle that we all face uh, with people with substance use disorders. I, I don't meet anyone anymore who doesn't know somebody who's struggling with addiction. We all have family, friends, relatives, neighbors, coworkers who are struggling with addiction. And we're doing everything we can. Uh, there's a desperate need, as you know, in, in rural Minnesota. A Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge several years ago, uh, probably around 2000. Uh, 14 or so, we began a study. Where do we need to go next? And Alexandria rose to the top of that. There's even the small program that was in Alexandria is now closed. Uh, we are uh, um, found a, a jewel of piece of property. We're currently constructing a new facility, and uh, the need is desperate. Uh, Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. Uh, uh, last year, we served 256 individuals from western Minnesota, just those few counties around Douglas County. Nearly 1,500 in the last 10 years have come to Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge. Everyone agrees that if you can attend treatment closer to your home area and the support services that, that are provided there, family, children, relatives, uh, the outcomes are better. This request for this, these additional uh, higher rate uh, GRH or supplemental services uh, provide dollars that will enable us to continue to provide 24-hour supervision, medication reminders for the clients, assistance with transportation, arranging meetings and appointments, arranging medical and social services appointments, things like March has been working with, helping them get a new social security guard, helping them get a new driver's license, replace their, their birth certificate, all of those things that are so important when someone has been stuck in a life of addiction. And so I would thank you uh, for your support for Bill 2529, and I'm open to any questions. Members, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just put in a plug. I've known this organization for actually as long as I've been here and prior to that, um, and just been very impressed. We talk about the 30% standard, and they're far beyond that, and uh, it's, you know, the 80%. Uh, I've known a bunch of people who have been through the program personally, and um, I mean, it's not perfect. No, none of these. No. It's a hard, hard audience, um, but in terms of cracking the nut, Mr. Chair, and putting money that it actually is going to make a difference and change a life, uh, this is that. You know, we put a lot of money into SUD, and I think this is like $2.5 two million or something over the four years or something. Um, so it's whatever it is. But it's it's um, money well spent. Hope we can find the money. Thank you. Uh, it's Senator, Senator Abler, I do too. The, um, we know this, to, to hear the Wilder, when the Wilder Foundation, those two studies that Senator Rasmussen talked about, um, to get 80% is just absolutely beyond, right? And, and, and knowing the long-term long -term side of that too. And, and knowing, if you look at, we all in the, in the world of recovery want various pathways to recovery, right? That means you're looking at the unique and individualized needs of the person in, in their recovery, right? And, and then what options, Minnesota's got some rich options in here, and this is one of them that you do, and it happens to be successful in that case. So I appreciate that yeah. stuff. And so, uh, Senator Asmussen, we have uh, May Senator uh, Mayquake. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Senator Asmussen, I apologize if I, I miss it at the, at the beginning. Is this bill specifically for um, uh, adult and teen challenge a brain or is this an example of what it would be for? Senator Asmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, or thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator uh, May Quaid. Um, these are specific rate bills for adult and teen challenge facilities in Douglas County and Crow Wing County. It's Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and are these connected to the, the National um, Adult and Teen Challenge Organization? Senator Rasmussen, Mr. Anderson. So there's a loose association, but it is uh, through accreditation, making sure that our buildings are safe, that we're using certain pieces of curriculum. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's very loosely connected, yes. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you're smiling because I think you know some of the questions that I have. So some of the things that, you know, we might have read about, um, does that loose affiliation transfer to things that happen here in the state of Minnesota or are those Different. things that don't happen here in the state no, of Minnesota? No, each, each corporation is independent. Uh, the, the use of the name Teen Challenge is, is licensed by the national office, but the national office is very small and doesn't represent all the opinions of all of the, the independent corporations that call themselves Teen Challenge. Senator May Quaid. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think we can leave it at that, but I, I, I have some concerns, but I don't think we need to dig into all of those right now um, on this bill. Right uh, this I would love to uh, sit and talk with you about any of those concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Senator Asmussen. And with that, um, with your amendment, the, we'll, we'll see how we're doing with the, the Douglas and Crow Wing, Crow Wing County. Uh, is the Senate file 2529 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Abler. Senate file 759, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this has to do with hospice care um, for children. Thank you, Senator Abler. So members, what Senator Abler is trying to get at here is that when a child requires hospice and end-of-life care, they receive these services either at their home or in the hospital. And so residential hospice services has long been an option for adults. However, Minnesota's only current operational um, residential pediatric facility um, is here. We got to get, there's a compliance issue here. Respite care is, is defined on a three to five day stay. But you know, this really provides on uh, MA coverage using state only funds for that hospice, hospice uh, respite. So uh, with that, I believe Senator Abler has a, a did you like what I just did, Senator Abel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You did it better than I could have, I think. So again, <laughs> turning it over to the knowledgeable entities. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the bill is a really quite a good bill, but it's not quite perfect. But had the A1 amendment um, that describes the, the rates um, that would uh, be coming here. And actually, after you read it, you'll have no idea what it says anyway. There must be 100% of the Medicare rate for continuous home care hospice services as published in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Annual Final Rule Updating Payments and Policies for Hospice Care. And uh, Mr. Chair, I have, a, I have a feeling that no one in the audience knows what it means either, but I'm told to do this to put the bill in the proper shape. I bet you Ms. Bailey understood what you just said, Senator. Well, I, so. with, I bet the whole corner of people up there, Mr. Chair, probably does. But I think it's important to amend the bill so it can work. And uh, Senator, seeing the A1 amendment is in front of everybody, the, the nice job, Senator Abler. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. It is as you fit. Katie Linderfelser, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Hoffman. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of Crescent Cove. Our mission is to offer care and support to children and young adults who have a shortened life expectancy and to their families who love them. This is an important bill for us in our state as leaders in our country, caring for children who are dying and who need respite. We have Minnesota's only children's hospice and respite home located in Brooklyn Center. It has five bedrooms where children with life-threatening conditions stay for a short break. For 24-7 medical cares that are provided to them while they're not in the hospital or at their home. And we also provide sacred care at the end of life. We're one of only three children's hospice homes in our whole country. 
and we're grateful for the support that you provided Senator Hoffman and Senator Abler as authors of this bill back in 2016 and last year and now again this year um, to look at the license so that it would be inclusive of a place where children can stay when licensed as a residential hospice. There's no coverage for the care that we provide with nurses and therapists providing 24-7 care to children while at Crescent Cove. And there are no out-of-pocket costs for the families who we care for. So our operations are primarily funded by philanthropy. And thank you to our state leaders for looking at this bill, considering state funding for end-of-life care for children with life-threatening conditions and their families. Thank you, Ms. Lyndon Felser. You know, the, um, it was the then... Uh, representative, he still runs around this place. Uh, Nick Zerwas was the House author, and I was the Senate author. And, and to see that happen, to you know, it was just I'm smiling because I was there, you know, watching you guys want to get this place going and the families that are touched by that. It just um, thank you for doing what you're doing. A hard time thank for, you for families to it be happen, there. Senator Harmon yeah. Killebrew is, I think, part of that conversation as well from the get go. So. Um, Members, any questions? Mr. Chair. Senator. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, this committee just, if you don't have a heart coming into it, it, it will grow as you get to hear the stories. And we didn't hear from some of the parents, but if you did, it would just make you proud to be a part of this committee and the services we can provide. And uh, some of the comfort that can be brought at places like this is probably just uh, in, uh, indescribable. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. I guess there's a question. I, you know, with the amendment, when it was drafted, was it drafted to the fiscal note? Does somebody... That amendment... I got a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was drafted to the fiscal note. Does that sa satisfy the... Yep, thank you. I got, look, at I got two thumbs up, three thumbs up. So you, ready? you want to give me a fourth thumbs up on that? <laughs> so Senate filed... Um, I should know this bill. Senate file 759 uh, as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Senator Abler, you want to stay there? I Direct do. Care Service Corps pilot project to salad mission and appropriation. And thank you, Senator Abler. Mr. Chair, I have some testifiers coming who are uh, going to be much more interesting than high. Do you want me to move it? Mr. Chair, just to get the bill in order, and then I'll just, you know, we're doing well on time, so I'm just not even going to bother to try to describe it. So um, look at this army I've got here. You're rule so. breaker, Senator Abler. We, we, we laid out five minutes each, and now you got three people up here. So how are you going to stay within the, uh, the I'm rule breaker? I'm attempting to you? ditch my time, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. So, um, and if you want to cut Mr. Rob <laughs> after five minutes, then we'll have to fight about that. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A1 amendment um, clarifies the, uh, that it's the Minnesota Metropolitan Center for Independent Living instead of some other words. So again, Health Force Minnesota Metropolitan. So whichever term you like better, we prefer the other one. So I move the A1 amendment. Members, I saw that A1 amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the A1 amendment indicate saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator Abler, to your point, uh, Rob, I uh, try to stay. We're going to stay within the fronts because I got to tell you, our committee administrator did try to keep that to one person and made that very clear and actually uh, is connected a lot of flack. And there, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you came in, but there was somebody holding a sign out front that didn't like what we were doing uh, on that aspect, and we're just trying to keep to that. So we'll try piece. to keep within so, the well, remaining four minutes. Mr. I love it, Senator Real Abler. Fast. To that point, Rob, go ahead. Well, so essentially this program gives 500000 for a direct care service core program, stipends for student home caregivers uh, to enter the workforce. And it's a good program. Uh, we need innovative solutions. As many of you know, I'm, I depend. I got out of bed with help, my home care help. I... Uh, they weren't here today, so my mom took me. She's back there with the walker, and her knee hurts, so <laughs> it would be nice if I had more help. Um, you know, students are some of the best caregivers, and, um, you know, we're also getting national attention for this program, and uh, we hope that this is going to set the stage for a national program to come back and bring more funding into and sustain this. So, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Diane Drost. 
Um, I'm Diane Drust, and um, I've been here several times with our Women Staying Strong asking for support for this. The good news is that we um, received a Cargill grant, a Margaret Cargill Foundation grant, um, for 350000 And this past year, we have um, developed it with Health Force Minnesota, with Valerie, with Jesse from MCIL, with a large group of people from the Spinal Cord Network. We've reached out to higher ed. We know that in the home care field, there are not enough people to do the job. So if we go to expand the workforce by going to the college students, um, we can expand that to um, fill these positions for like Sam, my daughter back there, and for Rob. Um, we are all, all, our families are taking care of our kids and we're all getting old. When we die, if I drop dead tomorrow, Sam has no place to go. So we need to expand the workforce, bring more people into the field, and we want to leverage that with AmeriCorps funds. And so we are planning on applying for a professional service corps group um, grant, which would enable us to um, meet some of the workforce shortage issues. So um, the good news is Cargill believed in us. Yeah. They gave us three hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. It's only for one year. We need another year at least to show proof of concept. So that's what we're asking funding nice. for. We want, Senator Abler. We want you to believe in us. Yes. Yeah. So Mr. Chair, there was one more testifier, Mr. Dennis Prothero. However, he passed away yeah. because he could not receive care in two different circumstances. Yeah. And so no you know, more. there's some people I just want to never forget. Yeah. I never want to forget Dennis. Never. And it, it should never happen again. And what they're trying to do here is going to help that. So thanks, Mr. Chair. No, Senator Abler, you know, this is just gets to that piece, you know, and then um, no, no more. You know, you talked about that, you know, and every year we get to the why and it's like um, what we do in this committee is life changing and this is innovative. And I like the fact, Jesse, you're up here and that Senator Abler, you got it going through the Centers for Independent Living down there that's going to be important. I mean, it really is. So, Senator Labor, I was only giving you a hard time about being a rule breaker, but that's okay. You're, you can <laughs> you can do that anytime. No, Thank Diane, you, forget it. You're fine. I'm Blame it on Rob. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. With that, uh, as amended, it will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senate File 2944. Okay. Senator May No. Yes. Maybe. Senator Bolden around. Yeah, Senator Ailey might as well go back out there. You got it. You and Fate could, you know, you don't want to. He's so bad. <laughs> um. We'll have uh, we'll have our folks get a hold of uh, <laughs> Senator Bolden, Senator Nelson. We're making great time, by the way. Should we wait for her? Do you want to? You're on that bill too, right? Isn't that your county bill? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, then she can come join you. Why not? Wait, here she's coming, I bet. And Senator Bolden is on her way too. Hey! Senator May Quaid, how are you? Mr. Chair, too bad she only has two minutes left. <laughs> oh, you know, this is, I knew this was going to come. I, I knew exactly this was going to happen. So I want to hear every word. Sorry, Mr. Chair. That, that's okay. Senator May Quaid, you can take as much time as you want. I'm thank, kidding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a tight 30 minutes. It's fine. No. 
Um, <laughs> it's good to see you. Welcome back. Thank you. No, seriously, welcome back. Thank I you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, Senate Bill 1926 was actually brought to me by the Inner County Association and the Association of County Social Services and Dakota County, my county. Um, it addresses the county cost share relating to individuals who are committed as mentally ill and dangerous, or MIND. Current law. Uh, says that counties must pay 100% of the cost for individuals who do not meet medical criteria, DNMC, at Anoka Metropolitan Regional Treatment Center. Um, and that means that direct care and treatment that has been deemed for an individual that they don't need at the hospitalization level, but they are needing services, they need to be transferred to the St. Peter Security Hospital because they're civilly committed. Um, as they await for transfer, the counties have to pay the... Um, the facility. And so as patients are awaiting a transfer from a state-run facility to a state-run facility, that cost is being passed on to the counties. And counties have no ability to direct individuals from one state-operated facility to another. And so this bill is meant to change the requirement that county property taxpayers are responsible for paying a state-run facility for waiting a transfer to another state-run facility. And I have Julie Ellis, I believe, online who can uh, testify further. <coughs> And Mr. Chair, if I can move my amendment uh, to get the bill in the order that I'd like it. Members, the A1 amendment is in front of you. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, say aye. 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 Post same sign. Senator, it looks like um, Julie. you want to, you got Julie, I think, yeah, I see Julie Ellis. Um, Stearns County is testifying on, do you want to go to Julie, the Please. one, Senator? All right. Miss Ellis, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm testifying from my home, and I'll apologize in advance if one little dog can't be quiet, <laughs> so I hope that doesn't happen. So my name is Julie Ellis. I'm a Human Services Director in Stearns County. I'm representing Stearns County today, Micah, as well as Maxa in my testimony. Forensic beds are at capacity in Minnesota, and individuals are stuck in beds that are inappropriate to their needs, but and unable to move because there's not a bed available. Under current statute, Counties are billed 100% of the cost of care when an individual no longer meets medical criteria for hospitalization, yet we're completely powerless to move the individuals to their next bed under an MIND, or Mentally Ill and Dangerous Commitment. In 2022, Stearns County paid $340,000 in county levy dollars for one individual stuck at AMRTC awaiting a bed at St. Peter. This represents more than 200 days. Another county paid $350,000 for one individual awaiting a transfer from AMRTC to St. Peter. This represented 209 days. There are numerous other examples across the state, but just these two examples total over a half million dollars. Additionally, these funds are not applied to mental health costs, rather they go directly into the general fund. It is unjustifiable to hold the county taxpayer financially responsible for bed days at the cost of over $1,600 a day when we have absolutely no control over moving the individual to the next appropriate bed. It is time to end this unfair practice. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Ms. Ellis, thank you for all you do uh, in uh, you. the county-based human services. That's great. Uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate Senator McQuaid bringing this bill. It's uh, really important. And uh, a couple things I just wanted to emphasize for the committee, um, I represent the least pop one of the least populated counties in the state of Minnesota, Traverse County. Only about 3,300 people live in Traverse County. And I they live that. under the, the fear that if they had one of these cases, it, it could eat up their entire human services budget. And they have no ability to control um, what happens in situations like this. Ottertail County, this has been an issue where they've had to outlay you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for an individual case. And I also think it's, it's a good bill for aligning incentives. If, if we have a capacity constraint um, and DHS is effectively pushing that cost onto our counties, yeah. um, they should be responsible uh, for at least some of those costs to help create an incentive to fix capacity problems that we have in the system. So I appreciate Senator McQuaid bringing this bill today. Mr. Chair. Senator McQuaid. I'd like to thank Senator Rasmussen for both helping me understand this issue more and really being the first person I turned to to say, do you know anything about this? And he was like, yes, let me tell you. So I, I appreciate his co-authorship and his, and his advocacy around this as well. I appreciate you working 
together, this is actually, I mean, here's the system's little one-offs, but they're not really one-offs because there's some, what else is sitting out there, right? So I appreciate you guys highlighting this. And not that we want to legislate by not aligning our corn cans up to our corn cans, you know, but um, this is, uh, you know, we just have to keep thinking on the bigger picture on this. I appreciate you guys bringing this stuff forward. I really do. Senator Asmussen going to Senator Utke. He has a question. Actually, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, no questions. Um, I hate to disappoint you, but I was just going to uh, piggyback on Senator Rasmussen. I, up in my area, uh, the one county is a little bit bigger, a few more people, but uh, they get a bill for 330000 for one person. So that's the type of thing we're looking at, that uh, this would help out a lot. Wow. Wow. 3,300 people. Champlain Park High School's got 3,300 people just in one high school, and then Elka Hennepin, which is the largest That's school good. district in the state of Minnesota. Senator Mayquay, I think I've heard you that, know Mr. that. Chair. Senator Mayquay, to your bill. Thank you for bringing it forward. I think everything's been said, Mr. Chair, and I really hope uh, that this can make it in that final omnibus. Thank you, Senator Mayquay. Senate file 1926 uh, as amended will get laid over possible inclusion, and uh, let's chat. Thank you very much. Senator, looks like driving us all the way up from Faribault, Minnesota, and he drives in the left lane. He goes 50 miles an hour in the left lane. Senator Jasinski, Senate file 743. Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Ms. Senator Utke. I think that uh, Senator Jasinski had a bill a couple years ago that took care of that issue of driving slow in the left lane. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Senator, Senator, is that a Tomasoni tie? Excuse me? Is that a Tomasoni tie? Not yet. No, it's you, not. I hear you're getting some. We are going to get some. That's right. Thank Dante's you. Dante's bringing some down. So. Senator Jasinski, you don't have an amendment. I'm proud of you. So thank you for uh, bringing it. looks like a fiscal note is just being handed out as well. But rate increase provision for your ICF uh, facility there. And, um, and you have Ashley Fredericks here too. So Senator Jasinski, your bill. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to introduce Senate file number 743, and I guess I should have uh, guessed the harassment was coming from you, but uh, just on all kinds of issues. But again, thank you for hearing this bill. I've, I've talked with this you, with, to you on this one. Oh, great. So now the guy said, he, I got quoted saying Joe, but now I'm going to get some harassment thing filed now. You got, you know, this is like, uh, you know, go ahead. Well, you Senator, kind of just... been giving me a hard time, so I got to give a little bit back. So. I know. Uh, thank you again. I know we've talked about this uh, personally. Uh, Senate file 743 is a bill that will have great impact on the people uh, with disabilities in my community. Uh, the bill increases the rate from reimbursement for the Kaplan Woods Care Home, an intermediate care facility located in Otana. Uh, the facility is home to residents who have high medical needs who require assistance in daily living. Uh, for many of these residents, uh, the facility has been their home for a couple decades, and the staff that work there have become like family. This bill establishes a rate increase that is needed in order to, for this facility to meet the increasing needs of its current residents, serve the people on the waiting list in need of services, uh, maintain the facility, and recruit and retain quality staff. This facility is in Otana and has one of the lowest reimbursement rates in the state. Uh, but it serves some of the people with the highest needs. Uh, this bill would make the rate consistent with other facilities that serve similar clients. Uh, with that, I have Ashley Fredericks, the general manager of the Kaplan Woods Care Home, uh, with me to provide testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Jaczynski. Thank you. And uh, Ashley Fredericks, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ashley Fredericks, and I'm the general manager of Kaplan Woods Care Home in Owatonna. Thank you for the chance to appear in front of you in support of this bill. Before I start, I'd like to thank Senator Justin C. for his support in carrying this to legislation. Kaplan Woods is a 16-bed Class B intermediate care facility, one of over 100 in the state that care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our goal is to provide the same compassionate care and love to each of our residents that a wonderful mother or father would. Many of our residents don't have family members, so we are their family. We are known for taking on very challenging individuals with both behavioral and medical conditions and helping them thrive while making positive progress with both health and behaviors. To put the medical care in context, some residents we feed through G-tubes or we need to monitor 24-7 for severe conditions such as diabetes, seizures, COPD, some are blind and many have degenerative conditions in addition to the mental health challenges. 
Many of our residents come from other care homes where the sending home gets to the point where they can't or they just no longer want to take care of that resident. I'm here today to ask for a rate increase so we can continue to serve and be the family and community our residents deserve. Although we serve individuals with very high needs, our reimbursement rate is among the lowest in the state. A rate increase would allow us to hire more skilled staff, increase wages and benefits to existing staff, serve people who are on our waiting list, and upgrade our aging facility. The work we do is difficult and mostly thankless. We are sworn at, verbally abused, deal with stubbornness, bad behaviors, bad smells, difficult family members, and a mountain of paperwork to document all of it, just to name a few. We do it because everyone needs care, love, and to live a life of purpose, and that's what we strive for, for each of our residents. The best analogy I give you is that this is not just about the cost of care, but this is about the cost of being a family member. We're not just caring for our residents in the facility, but we are with them out in the community doing life. We are with them when they go to the hospital at 1 a.m. or require a trip to the doctor, the dentist, or therapist. We get gifts for them at holidays and work to make their birthday special. There are so many things that go into what we do. This also includes holding their hands when it's time for the end of life. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm exceptionally grateful for your willingness to hear our requests. And on behalf of our entire team, we be grateful for your support. Thanks for your time and your consideration. Thank you, and thank you for your care. I am, this is why our committee exists, and, 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 and you're why we exist, and we need to be thankful and grateful for the work that you do. Um, I am just burning up inside because of the reality of what's happening to our elderly, with the reality of what's happening to our people with disabilities, the reality of what's happening and how we're not focused on, not we're not, we're not, but it's, it's hard to see and other people don't see that reality and you're bringing the reality to us and I appreciate you for doing that and um, thank you and, and thank you, Senator Jasinski, thank you for Thank you, Senator Jasinski. And you even, you know, we did a we did a conversation with some providers in your area uh, a couple years ago. I mean, it, it is statewide, members. This, co you know, on this committee, we get it. You know, we're there, and we appreciate you coming. And now we just got to get everybody else to get it too. So, um, Mr. Senator Abler, ditto. Oh, you said it good. So I, <laughs> I totally agree. Thank you. I love it. Isn't that great? I said this is. You know, this is why this committee, I, I love this committee, I do, because of the fact that you line up everybody on a spectrum of political correctness, right? And I don't know, I wouldn't even be on the correctness side because I'm never correct. But then when you look at things, but, but what's the one thing that we do here, and it's exactly what you do, and everybody can 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 say we got to do the right thing. And they leave their egos out in the hallway, and I just absolutely... That's why I love it. I love this committee. I love what we do here, and I love what you do, and thank you for coming here. So anybody, anybody else? Thank you. Senator Jasinski, um, you are Senate File 743. We'll get laid over for possible inclusion. And you say possible or probable? Probable. Thank you. Possible? Probable? I don't know. Is there a thank difference you, between Chair. the two? I mean, if you want, since you do, I do have that coming, by the way. Senator Abler? <laughs> Agencies? Didn't you guys do a provider and agency thing? You should have been here earlier, so. Yeah, I love it. Send it to the floor. No, we'll be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your help with this. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, members. <laughs> thank you, Senator Zinski. <laughs> Senator Bolden, so nice of you to come here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy well, to be here. Welcome. Good to, good to see you here. Do you have any amendments? I you do. do, Mr. You got Chair. A, you got a, it. Looks like an A one is on here because you're doing Senate File 1483, correct? Is that in your packet, folks? Is the A one? Is it A one? Mr. Chair, I'll move the bill on the amendment. Thank you, Senator. Moves the A one amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator Bolden to your A one and your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear this bill today. This is a bill that expands uh, medical assistance hospice coverage to include room and board um, for people receiving hospice services in a community-based setting. 
Uh, the medical assistance hospice benefit currently covers hospice services, such as physician and nursing services, counseling, respite care, home health aid and homemaker services, therapy services, um, and those are provided in response to a terminal illness. Currently, the medical assistance benefit does not cover room and board uh, for these services. And uh, members, this bill was brought to me by a constituent, uh, and she uh, was not able to be here today, unfortunately, um, but does have some testimony provided in your packets. And if uh, it's all right, I would like to read just a portion of it to sort of tell uh, her story. So um, her name is Tony uh, Megs Megskow, uh, and she writes about her mom. In March of 2020, she says, my mom made a decision to stop her cancer treatment and enter into hospice care. At the time, she resided in an assisted care living facility, and the staff were unable to provide for her needs. So I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Uh, her mother then uh, went into a hospital um, during the time that she was trying to find uh, the next facility, the next place where she would go for care. Um, she didn't want to go to a skilled nursing facility. However, that was the uh, only um, place that could be identified for, for her to seek care because of the, in, the inpatient um, hospice benefit was not covered under medical assistance for her. So because that was not covered, she ended up going to a skilled nursing facility that had an opening. Uh, she said it was a gut-wrenching decision to have to make uh, to place her mom in the skilled nursing facility as they had an open bed. She said, my siblings and I were working full time and couldn't bring our mom into our home to provide care around the clock. We were at a loss. So after 10 days in the hospital, her mom went to the skilled nursing facility. She says half of the staff were temporary workers. It seemed there was a new staff person every shift. The staff were very slow to respond to the call light. By this time, my mom was on no medication and her only request was to have ice water and an occasional popsicle. Toward the very end of her life, the request was only for ice water. This may seem like a simple request, but in a short-staffed skilled nursing facility with patients that had more immediate needs, this seemed to be overlooked each shift. In the end, she died alone, without family or staff by her bedside. Skilled nursing care didn't seem to be a good fit for her end-of-life care. So members, this isn't to say that skilled nursing facilities um, are not good places and don't provide good care, they do, um, but they are not designed for end-of-life care. And so um, for my constituent, this bill isn't going to change what happened to her family or her mother, but she doesn't want what her mom went through to happen to any other families. Uh, and so members, I would ask for your uh, support for this bill to include uh, room and board care uh, in the hospice benefit for medical assistance. Senator Abler. The staffing thing is ruining everything, Mr. Chair. It's uh, ruining the ability to help little kids with autism to get over it and people at the end of their life, to give them a better life and people at the end of their life to not enjoy the last days and not even get ice water. I've, I don't know, I don't remember hearing that before. You, you got me on that one, so I'm... That's just like, As a nurse. I'm dying, can I have a glass of water? No. <laughs> like, could you remember give me water? No, I'm sorry, I can't remember that. I'm just, but they're so busy doing this. The yeah, staff but, doesn't. No. Isn't there, like, they're just like so overloaded. No, thank you, Senator Bolden. I appreciate Oh, God, thank you. I, um, Yvette's, my, Yvette, who's my spouse, her mom, at her and you know was surrounded by family and you know it was just water right I mean it was uh, um, but to die alone and with no water that yeah you got me um, I, I were what's there should be there's no I think there's still a, there's a requested this can't be that big a dollar amount, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's a requested fiscal note uh, out there, but yeah, it's, um, I'm sorry, your friend. I really am. I mean, I, I don't know what else I can say other than let's make it like she said to you, right? And thank you for caring. As a parent to a parent, thank you for caring. Senator Mr. Abel. Chair. And so, um, you know, the, there's a proposal here which, you know, you don't know what it costs, but it seems like one answer. The other answer is to try to find a way to get enough staff in the door, like we've been trying forever. And I think that the good thing is that, Senator Bolden, you could be proud that the, the Senate has led the way 
in this for the last several years um, with silence on the side of the upper echelon and then us trying to push really hard for that. So um, I, I'm proud of that. So and so I, I think that we're still committed to that, Mr. Chair. And I, I hope that absolutely. you see that. I think you, thank you. I love it. Senator Boland, thank you. I am. Um, with that, Senate File 1483 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion into our omnibus. Senator Bolden, Senate File 1489. I, th I think, Senator Bolden, um, it would be remissful if I didn't recognize that somebody who just walked in this door in the back is uh, Senator Dave Sengem, who uh, is now your county commissioner. Isn't that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. So do, do we have to call him what? Commissioner, Commissioner. <laughs> welcome, Senator. Good to see you, Senator Bolden. You have uh, human services provider workplace safety grants and appropriation, and there's also a there is uh, there's a fiscal amounts from bill appropriation. It looks like ten, ten, and twenty. So, Senator Bolden, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do have an amendment for this bill as well, the A two. You do. Is that in everybody's packet? Absolutely. Mr. Chair, I think Senator Fate wants to move that amendment. Or does Senator McQuaid, if Senator McQuaid wants to do it. Senator, Senator McQuaid, you move the A2 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the A2 amendment. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, say sign. <laughs> to your amendment, thank you, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, and thank you for hearing this bill. Um, this is a bill that is actually connected to staffing, which is a topic that we uh, just talked about. And so um, this is uh, a bill that would create grants to increase safety measures uh, in human services workplaces. These are places that provide behavioral health care services for children, families, vulnerable adults, older adults, and people with disabilities, and other social services. Um, we have seen an increase in violence uh, over the last several years in many of the caring professions, and this being one of them. Um, and that Im directly impacts staffing. Um, so this is a measure both to help to keep people sit safe, staff safe, and to support organizations who want to do that, um, which will in turn uh, affect staffing and increase our, our workforce um, our workforce. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Cherry, uh, we do have some uh, testimony and uh, look forward to questions. Thank you. Looks like Michelle San Cartier is with us. Uh, thank you from the Minnesota Social Services Association. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. This Hi, is your everyone. first time in front of us, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. Did you go yeah, through, first time did you go not through online. Chisholm? Did you well, drive through Chisholm on your way? To I did not. All just right. uh, West St. Paul. All right. I was just I'm yeah. just trying to get to Chisholm. I'm trying to get Valentini's. I don't know if anybody <laughs> knows anybody, but anyway, that's, I'm glad. Welcome. Ms. Thank you. Welcome. Um, well, thanks, Chair Hoffman, members of the committee. Um, so as I said, uh, my name is Michelle Sancartier, Director of Policy and Advocacy with Minnesota Social Service Association. Uh, I've already talked to a lot of you about this super important bill. I want to make sure that I'm sharing one of our members' stories with you about work, workplace safety um, because it needs to be heard. Um, and so I want to share, make sure that as many of you as possible are hearing it. Um, and so as Senator Bolden said, this bill would establish grants to human service organizations to help them provide safety for their employees. So investing in things like safety training, um, safety equipment, facility improvements, counseling, and systems so that they could track um, safety incidents that are occurring. Um, so I have a background in human services. Now, like many of you, I work in an office. I don't face a lot of threats to my physical or psychological safety. Uh, this isn't the truth for many people who work in human services. Um, and I wanna share a story, uh, the story that I mentioned from Megan. Uh, so one of our members, Megan says, in October 2021, I experienced a physical and sexual assault while on the job. Right after I started my job, I experienced a situation where I was threatened and yelled at. I didn't feel safe going to the, into the home again, but I didn't have the tools to effectively communicate this or keep myself safe. Later in the same month, I experienced the joy of getting married. Prior to taking time off for my wedding, I received a case involving a client who needed to meet face to face. 
The events that followed at our first meeting were traumatic and have deeply affected my life. During that meeting, I was physically and sexually assaulted. I'm not going to go into detail about my assault, but at our first meeting, my breasts were grabbed, my crotch was touched, and I was choked. It was a living nightmare and has left me with a great deal of post-traumatic stress. I shared the journey of my marriage to highlight that I'm a human, not just an employee number and not just a provider. I'm a wife, daughter, sister, and now someone who experienced a traumatic event. It ripped away at the first year of experiencing joy in my marriage as I was consumed with trying to cope. This has not only impacted my ability to trust others, but has increased my overall anxiety in day-to-day -day situations. I care deeply about my clients. I want to do my best work, and in order to do that, I need assurance that my safety matters, and I need resources in order to keep myself and my clients safe. Um, Megan's story isn't unique. We've heard this from uh, many members across the state. These situations, so unsafe situations in human services exist. They're normalized and they're not gonna go away by ignoring them. Um, when we do ignore them, we send a clear message about who we value. Uh, we're in the midst of a workforce crisis that's projected to get worse. Human service providers are gonna be needed more than ever, and they're not gonna tolerate working in positions that don't ensure their basic human rights. So I urge you um, to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work. So is this a quick question on clarifying? Is this, were you looking at ongoing money on this one, Senator Bolden, one time? This is one time money, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right, members, questions for the good senator from Rochester? Man, I'm feeling Rochester love here. There's like a whole bunch of Rochester people right behind you. Do you realize that? No? Questions? Madam Chair. Or, I'm not, sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I should have got more sleep. Senator um, Abler. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but I remember your testimony from before, and it was mm -hmm. compelling then, it was compelling now. And so I, I'm just sorry for, I have nothing to do with it, but I'm just sad and sorry for you, how you have to come and tell us this and still be affected by it. And I. And you're asking us to think of how many others might be in the same boat, both now and in the future. And so, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, hopefully, it, anyway, just wish you the best. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Senator Bolden. Any last words? Uh, no, just Mr. Chair. Appreciate the consideration of the committee. Uh, we know that this is a significant issue. Health and uh, human services providers are more likely to experience workplace violence than those in many, many other fields. And so, yeah. this is um, would be, I feel, a good use of one-time money to to make you know workplaces safer. Everybody deserves to have a safe workplace, and this is work that needs to be done across our state. Thank you, Senator Bolin, and thank you, uh, Senate File fourteen eighty nine, as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Next up, um, Senator Nelson. Come on down. Are you bringing Senator Senjin with you, too? I mean, you don't know. There's Ro just Rochester. Just you got Rochester people just hanging out. Uh, I think, did you bring April Suter? She's, yep, April. Mr. Chair, I don't know. Do you think I can have Senator Senjin sit beside me just for yeah. one more time? That'd be I great, know, actually. I him to talk, but he's not. Did All you right. want him? No. Uh -huh. You're welcome to sit at the table, Senator Sinjum. Okay. Mr. Chair, I've got a question for him later, so you might as well get there. He might as well come up, because you're, you're, now you've come in here. You know, if you come in this room, you're going to get questions. So just like, you know, Dan Pollack was in here earlier when I talked about manna, but, you know, he's here now. I did get that quote out, by the way. That was good. So, Senator Nelson, welcome to the committee. It is so good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is great to be here. And uh, members, uh, Mr. Chair, thanks for hearing the bill. It's the Live Well at Home grants. And I also want to thank my co-sponsors, Senator Fatah, Senator Housley, Senator Hoffman, thank you, Sit Chair, and Senator Jasinski. And uh, I also want to just mention, uh, Mr. Chair, before I talk briefly about the bill, uh, the amazing uh, collaborators who have worked on the bill, the work that you see before you. Family Services Rochester, AARP, and the Minnesota chapter of the Alzheimer's Association all worked together on the bill before us. And uh, Mr. Chair, before we start, I should um, 
I hope you have the delete all amendment in your packet. It's the A1 amendment. We do not have the delete all. You know, delete all. Hold on. So hold on one second, Senator Nelson. So here's an option, committee members. It's six pages long. Uh, the printer is printing. It's take a while to print. So the, the options are either I go into recess, this is our last bill, or we just let Senator Nelson chat with us about the uh, the project, and then April can get talking about that. Senator Rasmussen, you got an opinion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is, it, is the amendment A1? Yes. It is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A1 amendment, and I uh, would appreciate if Senator Nelson could explain it. Yeah, and then this, at six pages, it's coming, so that's fine. Uh, A1 amendment's moved, so you can just start chatting to us, and we'll just wait. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so the you should have Senjim read it, actually. That yes, be exactly. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, uh, the Live Well uh, at Home grants are highly effective at helping Minnesotans stay in their homes longer and delay costly long-term care costs. Uh, and yet, one of the issues that's addressed in this amendment, members, is that these grants are just uh, short grants uh, one year in length. And you can imagine the challenge, the uncertainty, the staffing concerns, and the inefficiencies if you're trying to help someone stay in their homes and it's a one-year grant. Uh, and so that has been a significant challenge. And when you get the A1 amendment, you will see that rather than uh, these short one-term grants, uh, they um, are uh, ability, we've given DHS the ability to, um, to lengthen those grants. Uh, the A1 amendment specifically, members, it does three things. It consolidates the Live Well at Home grants, which are already in law, into one section of statute. Uh, uh, Mr. Monahan is very good at that as far as uh, cleaning up our statutes so they're easier to read and understand. Uh, secondly, it clarifies the purpose of the grant. And then thirdly, the point I mentioned, it establishes a process for DHS to sustain the grants with a longer term of funding if, obviously, they're meeting grant goals. So the Live Well at Home grant program is a proven resource, as I said, to help seniors continue to live where they want to live, in their homes and in their communities. And Senate File 1902 will expand access to long-term services and supports such as respite care and core funding for small home and community-based service providers. It will keep seniors in their communities longer. Every senior I know wants to live in their community, but sometimes they can't do so without some help. And the Live Well at Home grant is a flexible funding source that helps support volunteer respite programs across the state and tribal nations to help uh, seniors stay in their homes longer. And maybe you, like uh, myself, have run into some of these seniors as you were out going door to door. Every, uh, every year we do that, and every year I run into someone who is a senior who is being supported by a neighbor uh, to neighbor. Neighbors who are coming in volunteering to help with either mowing the lawn or maybe getting the groceries. So there are uh, important, important things that we can do to help our uh, senior stay in their homes longer. And it will also support uncare unpaid caregivers. I know you are all aware, uh, well aware of our family caregivers. Uh, they're kind of the backbone of our long-term care uh, system, and they play an essential role in caring for their loved ones and delaying that expensive nursing home care. Uh, the economic contribution of Minnesotans, 640,000 unpaid family caregivers is estimated to be $8.6 billion. Uh, this is even a bit higher than it was in 2015 when the Alzheimer's uh, Research and Support Act was before you. The need has continued to grow. Uh, and this does come at a cost. The stress and emotional toll of caring for a loved one with dementia needs and we see that caregivers are burning out across the state at increasing rates. Uh, caregiving burnout is one of the leading reasons for placements in the more expensive residential setting. So despite clear financial contributions of caregivers, their emotional, physical, and financial strenuous work is not recognized. So it's time to update and increase the funding 
Workforce in Senate File 1902 brings that much needed updates to the Live Well at Home grants, and it's a necessary infusion of new resources at a time of greatest need. And if we want to support seniors living in the community, we need to take action now and we need to invest in the programs that work, such as Live Well at Home Overview. There's three categories, cat capital development projects, including renovations for home, purchasing a vehicle for transportation purposes, and technology upgrades. I have a constituent who um, uh, has, um, well, I bet you have too, um, many times needed a ramp uh, up to their home. And this is one of the items that uh, these grants helps provide. Uh, category two is long-term services and support development grants to expand or man maintain access to long-term support services, integrate medical and long-term care services, and respite care. And then thirdly, uh, the third uh, core area is core home and community-based services. Uh, we know that organizations are funded under core home and community-based services, and they have operating budgets of uh, uh, that uh, are less than needed to sustain themselves, and these are uh, tied to a geographic uh, limited area. So members, I'd like to turn over, that's just a brief overview of the bill, remembering that the goal is to help seniors stay in their homes longer and delay more expensive long-term residential care. I'd like to turn the, uh, turn the hearing over, Mr. Chair, if I could, to my testifier, uh, April Souter, who would uh, be glad to give you a little bit more information on this. She's the Director of Family Services, Rochester. So before we go there, Senator, thank you. You did a um, thank you for thoroughly explaining what um, you actually your delete all. You you went through that. Members, uh, Senator Rasmussen renews the uh, A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. I think we already did that, didn't we? No, we didn't. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you. So um, April Souter, welcome, welcome. You drove all the way up Highway 52. 52. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Well, Ashlam alaikum, and uh, thank you, um, members, for having me here today. I'm April Souter um, with Family Service Rochester, and I'm the leader of our senior independence work. Family Service Rochester provides home and community-based services to older adults in Olmstead and Rice counties. We've been fortunate to receive DHS Live Well grants over a number of years. And along with colleagues from across the state, the grants helped us establish successful innovative programs. The current Live Well grants are generally for one year and not meant for long-term support. This lack of stability presents a serious challenge when trying to sustain services for lower income seniors who are unable to afford the fees that cover the costs. Likewise, in rural areas, the senior population may simply not be sufficient in number to provide a minimal consumer base necessary to support a service provider. For successful programs like those once present in La Crescent, Albert Lee, Chatfield, the loss of a grant like Live Well meant programs closing their doors. Volunteers form the core of our service delivery model. Last year, more than 800 volunteers gave 44,942 hours of service, helping 988 seniors in our two counties to age in place. That's a full 21.6 full-time staff. For us, volunteers perform 90% of our senior services. We utilize a sliding fee scale model where consumers contribute to the costs of services based on their income. Consumers do contribute to the cost, and volunteers make services accessible and affordable. Despite these diverse funding streams, consumer contributions, and remarkably dedicated volunteers, sustainability remains a constant struggle. Seniors don't go away. 
and their needs don't stop just because funding does. With no services, seniors have little choice but to move to residential facilities where their resources are quickly depleted. Then they turn to the government for support. Providing services that help older adults age in place saves government and in turn taxpayers money. Stable, renewable funding for organizations who deliver results is what we need and what we seek through this legislation. Doing so builds statewide capacity and stability for home and community-based service providers and family caregivers. So please, help us meet the growing needs of the fastest growing demographic in Minnesota, older adults, in the most cost-effective manner and in the environment of their choice, the homes and the communities they know and love. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Souter. Any member discussion? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And a uh, question for Senator Nelson. Um, when I go back to the back page under appropriation, and it is a grant um, system, and because it's a locked in number, the anticipation, or at least the way I would read it, is uh, grants would be taking taken up to and including that amount if it was used, right? And then grants that come in after that would just not be in play for that year? Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Utke, it is a grant program as long as available. And of course, the uh, amount is a $15 million each fiscal year. Right. Yep. Senator Utke, any follow-up? Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's that's the way I read it. I just wanted to confirm it was it would go till it was used up, and then that would be it for the year until next year. And um, I guess in with two years, if this is to go through, you get to test the water and see what that demand would really be, and come back again. But uh, thank you. Senator Nelson. I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And a good question. Uh, just to note, these are competitive grants, and uh, Senator Hoffman, I would like you to. Uh, I have something for you. Because I, I just, my light went off, my light bulb. Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, yes. It, it, you know, back in the day, in Iowa, we actually did this kind of thing. And, and this current program, it's funded, but in the state of Minnesota, that's why I ran into the corner. Um, it was only funded for five years, right? And so the question I'm going to go get with Ms. Bailey is if we look at changing language to keep the program intact and then see what kind of funding, you know, one time or whatever. That's where I was at now, yes. just saying there's some potential here. So yes. I just like this. Mr. Chair and Mr. Chair, uh, just to note, uh, and the, the interesting thing about these grants, and it's going to remind you of Mr. Chair of something we worked on called Innovative Compensatory Pilots. You might remember that. Um, okay, well, this is a similar thing in that these were innovative grants. And that's why they were only for that short amount of time. But to Senator Utke's point, we know what's working. We've seen it uh, in, in working. And the challenge is to continue to say an innovative grant for something that has proven success. So just like uh, you and I uh, changed those uh, compensatory pilots, which were working for those 11 school districts, we made those compensatory, just like the others, because we knew it was working. And it's the same thing right here. This is currently these innovative grants that um, have such a short time frame that they cannot continue. And so the important thing is to allow those that are working, that have a proven track record, uh, to continue to compete, but not for just a one-year time frame. So thank you, Mr. Senator Chair and Hoffman. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to Senator Nelson's point, that's why I was, I was going to get this fiscal note up to Ms. Bailey, and then uh, maybe she could give us a few words at the end. And I know you had some few words at the end, too. But um, these, are, these, these programs are really helpful and beneficial to families out there. And I just, it's like, you know, if I would have got, you know, we did this fiscal request. And if we would have wanted to pay people $20 an hour, it would have been $4 billion, right? 
the system. We know the system to fix the whole system would be in 5.4 billion. What did we get? 1.3 and 1.5. Need I say more on that one? But I just, you know, I'm grateful, but yet at the same time, it's really, uh, these are types of programs. It's like, let's find ways to be innovative, like Senator Nelson. She talks about the compensatory grant stuff. That was 10 school districts got a certain amount of money, and we saw that they were successful, and they kept coming back, piloting and piloting. And it's like, no, how do you make this a reality? And that's was what I'd like to get to Miss Bailey. So if you want to keep going with that, I'm going to just run this up the hill, and I'll be right back. Thank you. Senator Nelson. And Mr. Chair, uh, just to uh, Senator Hoffman's point, uh, just as with the compensatory funding, as it ran out, people were laid off because they weren't sure of the funding coming. That is the same thing that we're seeing here. And these things, these work. These do help keep people out of those long-term care settings. And many of you were here uh, when uh, my father was, had, was in those end stages of Alzheimer's. And uh, let, let's... Note, that was uh, $8,000 a month, $8,000 a month for that care. And it's uh, proven that if we can delay uh, the onset of need for that residential care, uh, and if we have the supports, like in this bill, uh, people can stay longer in their homes. So uh, I, I have no more comments, but would certainly appreciate uh, consideration by the committee. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Any other member comments? Um, Senator, Senator, Mr. Senator oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a quick question, um, Senator Nelson. I'm just looking at 5.15 and 5.16 on the DE. And um, I just want to, so if they're the only provider of an essential community service in a designated geographic area, um, would that change? Like if, let, let's say someone was providing like chore services and then another group opened up to do volunteer chore services, would it preclude then the original organization from okay. getting um, that support or that grant? Senator Nelson. Oh, I think that is a good question. I think that goes back to the original um, legislation. But I do, I would want to check on that to get back with you. And I'm going to ask uh, um, Ms. Souter if she has any experience with that. Ms. Souter. What I know that is in um, the area that we serve, we keep being asked by more and more of the smaller communities and the counties if we'll come in because they don't have any services. Um, and there are places like in the Twin Cities um, and Duluth and um, in Rochester, there's competitors. I mean, there's for-profits that will come in and clean your house and things like that. Um, there's not enough services to go around. And we're also looking at um, organizations trying to provide culturally appropriate services. And so they might start up, and they're serving just this population and only that group. So um, I th part of it is your, just what your population density is and um, Senator McQuaid, any thank follow you, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and no, I, that makes perfect sense. And um, I'm hearing so much that there's a need and not like an abundance. And I think because part of the goal is to kind of expand and grow, um, making sure that people, do, you know, if for some bold stroke of luck we have, you know, more people who want to provide services, that they would also be able to get the grants and not like their opening cost somebody to lose a grant. That would be my only feedback. Thank you. We also have uh, someone from DHS here. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Peter Butler, for the record, uh, from the Department of Human Services. I know there was just a question a bit about how the fiscal note was calculated. So just for starters, the $15 million a year was just because that was what was written for the appropriation. That could be scaled for that amount. But the reason why it's additional funding for this is that since this is for providers that have been successfully in the program for the five years, this is meant to continue giving them that extended uh, services so that they can keep going beyond that five-year period. One way of kind of looking at it might be that if they've successfully been delivering services through the five years, this is sort of a recognition that they should continue delivering the services to folks across the state. Thank you for that explanation. Any other member discussion or questions? No. Thank you, Senator Mr. Hoffman. Chair. That's exactly, I mean, that's, if there's a way we can kind of, you know, have further discussion on this and we'll just follow up with 
with Peter and, and Elise as we're looking at um, marking up our, or not marking up our bill, but laying our bill over. So this is a good conversation. I appreciate that. Great. Um, and with that, um, we'll uh, lay Senate File 1902 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And I think that uh, I don't know if we have any further. Do you want to let us know what's going on, Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator Hoffman. Um, just as a reminder, this Friday at 10 a.m., we'll be doing a walkthrough of the omnibus bill and testimony. Senator May Quaid over there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, or Senator, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Would you like to recognize me? I'm sorry. Senator um, May Quaid. Are there other committees meeting at that time? Uh, I do not know. Kevin, uh, our committee administrator was looking at that, and I think that he cleared the lane. Um, he can check on his CA thingy now. I, I thought we were pretty open. This was open at that time. So do you think you have a, you might have a conflict? Um, Senator McQuaid. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Hoffman, I think Senator Fate and I might have a conflict, state and local gov, I think. Is yours testimony? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is it just testimony you and you and the good senator from Minneapolis are, are doing on Friday? Do you know? Um, senator McQuaid. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, I don't know, actually. <laughs> this senator, testimony, Mr. Chair? Senator Hoffman. I believe it's just testimony, no action on Friday. That would be my, right? Kevin's shaking his head yes right by you, Mr. Chair. That's correct. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, I would think no matter what we do, there's going to be some conflict, unfortunately. But because we also have health, HHS in the afternoon, I think there's, that's the first thing I looked at there was there's five members of this board committee on that one. And so it's, it's going to be tough no matter what, but I think I'll leave it up to you guys to pick what works best to accomplish what you need to on for Friday. And just as clarification, I, the plan is to be done by 1 p.m. on Friday for this committee, if that's helpful for members. Senator Fate? Yeah, Senator McQuaid has to choose which committee she likes better. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Fate. Senator Fate. Okay. Ask Senator Mitchell first, because she's also on the committee. <laughs> I guess we'll have to wait till Friday to know, but uh, <laughs> if there's no further comments or discussions, uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>